Good evening, just kidding. Welcome to worship at our wall worship. It is good to be together. And a few announcements. Um, the funeral for Don Weger will be on Friday, September 8th at 11 o'clock, and um, the visitation will be at 10. Um, there is a um, anniversary party for Harold and Barb Nelson, if you're interested in that. There's information on the Rejoice Board uh, for address, and um, so that is September 2nd at 2 p.m. They have their 60th wedding anniversary. And um, the WOW Suppers are going to begin um, again, and there is information about that on the Rejoice Board. And on September 10th, there will be one service, not an 8.30 service, but a 10.30 service for a dedication, and then rally day for Sunday school. And I think that, oh, stick around for ice cream after. And I think that's enough announcements. Let us begin with our call to worship. Sisters and brothers, your coming here is not in vain. Though our faith is ignored and rejected by others, with courage we worship God. You do not come with deceit or impure motives. With God as our witness, we come to worship God. So deeply do you care for each other that you come to share the gospel again and again. God calls us to gentle witness as apostles of Christ. So let us worship God and our beginning song, our opening song. Holy One, we are, why are we always willing to descend into the worst areas life offers to us, but reluctant to come into your presence? Why can we stand and yet find it impossible to dance in your joy? Why are we so quick to trumpet our hollow achievements and do not seem to be able to hear your whispers of hope for us. Forgive us and fill us with your mercy. May we set our hope in Jesus Christ, who came so that we might be inheritors of love, peace, and faithfulness forever. Dear friends, 
in Christ, God's salvation has come. God's peace kisses our cheeks, wiping away our tears, and faithfulness takes us by the hand to lead us home to God. God has called us. God has claimed us. God has redeemed us. This is good news for all of creation. Thanks be to God. Amen. And let us pray together our prayer of the day. Gracious God, we chase after so many things that distract us from you. Give us wisdom to chase after you with our whole hearts. Amen. Friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, I've watched that bumper now for the last three weeks, and I finally, for the first time, saw the dog chasing its tail. Anybody catch that? I was, well, how did I miss that? That looks really fun. But uh, we're in our third week, in our final week of our series that we call Chasing. These things that we chase after in our life. And if you've been with us, uh, we, we began by talking about the need that we have to chase for approval, that we want everybody to like us, and sometimes that happens to our detriment. Last week we talked about the idea of being right and, the, and, and how that has been so ingrained, and actually we talked a little bit about how psychologists are pointing out that people who have to be right, it's actually a sign that there's something wrong with how they're doing and how they're, how they're being. Well, tonight we're going to move forward into the chasing after that money and stuff. The money and stuff seems like it's always there, right? That we, we want something and yet it, it just feels like it's out of reach. It's more than what we expected it to be. But we're told that we got to have it. We're told that you need to have this in order for your life to be fulfilled, for everything to be as good as it could possibly be. And sometimes this is what it feels like. We're running, our hands are out, we are almost there, we can almost catch it. It just keeps going, it keeps moving away, moving away. Now, some people might wonder, why is it that the church would even want to talk about the idea of money? If you bring up money in church for some people, right away they start to get a little squeamish, start to worry about what is going to get asked for, Right? Well, that's not this sermon. This sermon is not about an ask at all. This sermon is actually very biblical when it comes to us talking about money. And the reason why I say that is because Jesus addresses money and wealth, money and stuff, money and treasures, 11, in 11 different parables. And that, uh, that's just scratching the surface. If we look at the whole of the Bible, the whole of the Bible, there's roughly 2,350 Bible verses that deal with this topic. This is an important topic for God. It's an important topic for Jesus. And it's so important that he wants to make sure that when he teaches it, he teaches it very clearly. And we're going to look tonight at one of those moments. Jesus, right after doing the Sermon on the Mount, his next big conversation has to do with money. And he's there in front of his disciples and he's in front of a group of Pharisees. 
And Jesus is intentional about what he's going to say here because Jesus is very disappointed with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were supposed to be the example setters. The example setters of how God wants people to live. And the Pharisees weren't doing that. The Pharisees were corrupted. They were corrupted by money and stuff, by status. What mattered most to the Pharisees was where was their seat at the banquet. And they always expected and demanded the best. So that's the crowd that Jesus is talking to when we go into Matthew chapter 6. Let's take a look at this together. Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry. Do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus is addressing them and wanting them to better understand what it means to be caught up in this forever cycle and circle of chasing after stuff. Chasing after these things that, that we think that they thought at the time made them out to be something special. You know, the Pharisees had a lot of this. A lot of treasures. A lot of things they accumulated. And in accumulating all of those things, the one thing that the Pharisees failed to do was see the needs around them. They were more proud of all the stuff they had and not at all worried about the people that they were called to serve and be godlike examples to. It's not a new problem. This is a problem that was there back then. It was a problem that was even around before the days of the Pharisees. And it's a problem that we deal with. The issue really is about the materialism, this de desire to have stuff. To have not just money, but a lot of nice things and accumulate all these nice things. Materialism. If you look up the definition of materialism, you'll start to see that it doesn't, it's not compatible to our faith. Here's the definition of materialism. A tendency to consider material possessions and physical comfort as more important than spiritual values. That's the definition. Here is a philosophy of materialism. The doctrine that nothing exists except matter and its movements and modifications. Why is this so important? Why is this such a big deal to Jesus? Why is it that he had to teach about this in the way that he does? It's because Jesus understood the truth. It's the philosophy. The philosophy of materialism that operates as though God didn't exist. Think about that for a moment. Everybody who wants to accumulate stuff, everyone who needs to have more and more and more and more, their focus is not on God. Their focus is not on trusting that God is going to provide. Their focus is on themselves. It's the age-old sin of we can be just like God. 
And Jesus knew that was a problem. And Jesus knew where that was going to lead. And Jesus knew it when he said these words, Oh, you of little faith. Because Jesus knew that if you were more into your possessions, more into the wealth, you had no room in your heart for God. He was intentional when he used these words. Do not store up. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. And you know why he was intentional about that? It's because he wanted them to wake up and see, and he wants us to also see. Jesus is reminding us that this earth has an expiration date. If you're storing up stuff that comes from here, if you're looking at everything you got that comes from here, Jesus is telling you the earth has an expiration date. And you're storing things that are going to expire. But God wants you to desire things that will last forever. You know, there's that running joke, right, that you don't normally see a U-Haul behind a hearse. But there's a lot of people in our world today, a lot of Christians even today, that don't get that message. That I think deep down maybe believe that when they die, there will be a U-Haul behind them to show everybody all the stuff that they had accumulated. See, it doesn't work. It, it, it gets us out of balance. When we take a look at all that stuff, how did we learn to get to this point? How did we learn to value money and stuff over godliness? Over being the examples. You know, we, we're, be, we, we're acting like the Pharisees. We're not being good examples of followers of God. How did we get here? Well, guess what? It's been happening for a while. We got to this point over a long period of time. And it was all by the messaging we were hearing. Take a look at this. In the 1970s, in the 1970s, it was reported that the average person saw between 500 and 1,600 ads every day. 500 and 1,600 ads. They'd see them in magazines. They would hear them on the radio. They would see them on TV. All those ads trying to tell us how to make our life better and all the stuff we needed to be fulfilled. Look what happened in 2007. In 2007, it was estimated that the average person saw up to 5,000 ads per day. You know what else started to happen in 2007? It was about that time that we started to take note of this decline in participation in the faith. It was about this time in 2007 that a new group of people developed called the nuns. Those people that don't have any religious connection. This is when they started to pop up. You can start to see the correlation. The correlation? Well, wait until 2021. In 2021, the average person is now estimated to encounter between 6,000 and 10,000 ads every single day. 10,000 ads that talk to us every day saying you aren't enough and you don't have enough. That's the messaging. It's telling us that our life is not fulfilled unless we have X, Y, and Z. So that's why the church needs to talk about this. That's why, besides the fact that the Bible talks about it so many times, the reason why we need to talk about it is because you're talking about it. And you're hearing it. And you're hearing what the world says, what the culture says. And it's contrary to what Christ says. It's not calling you, the world is not calling you to build up heavenly treasures. They're not calling you to the life that Christ is calling you to live. They're calling you to something that is dying. Something that's going to fade away. That has an expiration date. This is why we have to talk about it. This is why we look at it from a biblical point of view. And this is why we turn to the Bible to hear good news and to hear some direction. And we can go all the way back to the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. 
In that Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, the writer says this. Now tell me this is not relevant. Whoever loves money never has enough money. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. Do you hear the chase? Can you hear the chase? All the way back in the book of Ecclesiastes, they were writing, telling people, warning them. And this was before they were getting 10,000 messages a day. To not fall for it. To not get caught up in it. We can turn to the New Testament. In the book of 1 Timothy. The book of 1 Timothy says this, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, what I want you to not hear is I don't want you to hear God doesn't want people to have money. God doesn't like rich people. That's not what is being said here. The issue is when the money and the stuff becomes more important than your faith. When the quest for money and stuff pushes out that place in your heart where God wants to be. That's what he's saying here. And everybody who does that has repeatedly found over and over again, not joy, but pain and suffering. The Gospel of Matthew, uh, verse 24 of chapter 6, says this. No one can serve two masters. Either they'll hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is why it's talked about that, that many times in the scripture. Because over time, money and stuff becomes more important than our relationship with God. It's historical. This is just one of our flaws. This is why it was so important for Jesus to talk about it. So know this. God knows. God knows that though we think we can control our wealth, our wealth always has a way of controlling us. It always has a way of telling us we don't have enough. And God keeps saying over and over again, but you are more than enough. I know you're more than enough. You're good. But as long as we're in this race, as long as we're chasing after it, we don't have peace. We don't have calm. And we're not hearing that voice from God telling us that we have enough. This is what God is trying to say to us. Paul wrote these words to the church in Galatia. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Money and stuff, the chasing of money and stuff can and often becomes a yoke of slavery that we put on ourselves. And God says you were not created to be that way. You were always created to be free. So remove the yoke, stand firm, and be free. So this week, as we think about this whole thing, I want to encourage you with these two things. First of all, know this. Know that God wants to set you free. God wants to set you free from that death grip that our wealth has on us. And the second thing is this. I want you to think about what do you need to do? What do we need to do to be more disciplined? To discipline ourselves for the purpose of being people who are godly of being those examples of people who live by faith, who trust that God is with them, who believe that God provides. And all the blessings that we have in our life come not simply by what we've done, but by what God does with us. How do we take that yoke and burden and take it off so that we can be free? This week, work on that. Join me as we work on it together, as we work on finding ways to be more purposeful, more purposeful to be God's people needed at this time and in this place. Amen. Let us join together as we sing our song of the day.
Let us confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. O wise and wonderful God, continually turn the hearts of your people back to you. Mold the church to your gracious, merciful, and righteous presence in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Generous God, fill all banquet tables with the bounty that you raise up in your creation. Feed all people with food that will sustain them, even as you feed them with your compassion and love. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of your Son, for showing us what our worth is to you, but becoming God with us. Help us to see our worth and live it out in our daily lives. Lord, in your mercy. Abundant creator, at this time we ask you to be with those who are struggling in our community. Give us reconciliation in our brokenness. Give us peace in our unrest. Give us healing in our hearts. Give us wisdom in our places of uncertainty. Dear Lord, we pray, especially for the hospitalized, homebound, those experiencing difficult and stressful times, those who are grieving, lonely, homeless, hungry, or hopeless. Be with those in our hearts who we care about. Lord, in your mercy. Remembering the saints who pointed us to Christ in the past, we beg for his presence among us today while we long for the day when, we, when he will make all things new. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Holy One, we entrust all whom we pray, confident in your abundant and abiding mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand if you are able for our closing song.
Have a wonderful week, and remember that you are the church wherever you may be, so go in love and peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.